so it's late in the day. Everybody's that energy is kind of waning. Um, so it's no mistake that uh, I actually asked Linda Einstein to talk now <laughs> because Linda has more energy, I think, than almost anybody else. Um, she has, she's been at, she's been, uh, well, she'll tell you her own story, but but she's been uh, involved with asbestos uh, and mesothelioma for a long time. Uh, and yet, every year she's always, uh, I mean, I've, I always get so many messages and, and uh, tweets and other things from Linda. And she's, she's always on top of everything 24 hours a day. So she has, I think, more energy than anybody else in, in regards to this, this kind of area. And so what I, what I asked her to do actually this time, uh, she was here last year and gave a great talk, but I wanted her to talk about how she stays focused and energized in this area for such a long period of time. Because it is a little bit of a struggle to keep focused and keep doing things when, when it still seems to be a struggle from year to year. But um, Linda, I wonder if you could mind come up and just give us your insight on how to do that. Well, I am the only thing that stands between you and probably a glass of wine. So thank you for staying through this entire day, and thanks to Dr. Cameron and his amazing staff for putting on this conference. As Bob said, um, I'm Linda Reinstein, the co-founder of the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization. And the Jarvis and the Reinstein family have something in common. We were angry when our loved ones found out that they were diagnosed with the mesothelioma. Although I've never met Chuck before, I'm very sorry for your loss. It was nearly 11 years ago when I heard those dreaded words muttered from Alan's thoracic surgeon. I think Alan has a type of cancer. And I looked at him thinking, hmm, it was nine months of undiagnosed symptoms that happened with Alan. Surgery confirmed he had mesothelioma. At that time, I didn't understand the difference between a cure and treatment. That night when I went home to the internet, I did. I found out Alan's cancer was terminal, and if he was lucky, he'd have six to 12 months. Our daughter was just 10 at that time. We were angry. We were urban, educated, and wondered what went wrong. So another family in Washington, D.C., and ours co-founded the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization. How could this be legal and lethal in the United States? How could we continue to import asbestos like Dr. Lemon says? How can 30 Americans die every day from a preventable asbestos-caused diseases? That's utterly wrong and unacceptable. So for the last 10 years, Dr. Lemon very respectfully serves as the co-chair of our Science Advisory Board, along with seven other distinguished doctors. And we work on education, advocacy, and community support. And as a disclosure, I want to make it clear we do not get involved in litigation. We do not make legal referrals. We do something that we think is really important. We take the information at hand. We know we have consensus. We know that every branch, every independent organization, and the government support, as Dr. Lemon and Dr. Kamen have said, asbestos is a known carcinogen, and there's no safe level of exposure. But why is this plaguing Americans today? It does because there's a long latency period, I humbly think, and also because it's been mucked up in courtrooms for far too long. No one really wants to step up to the plate and say, I may have been responsible, I want to invest in a cure for this disaster, because that may come along with some liability. But it's clear if you look back scientifically about how, how social movements start. It takes collective activism. It takes civil society, the private sector, and the government to come together, working collectively, harmoniously, and organically to make this end. When Bob first asked me, hey, Linda, can you talk about staying focused and energized? I thought to myself, what on earth am I going to tell these people? I just get up every morning, and I just do my job with amazing people like Dr. Lemon and Dr. Cameron. I don't think about it. So I actually had to step back and sort of analytically look at what we did and what we've been doing for 10 years. And I actually think the focus, the fuel, and the action is really what, what gets me going. We had to be very clear when we started this organization. I'm an accidental activist. I never set out to be a co-founder of the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization. And most people look at me like I'm nuts. They're like, what does that mean? So it's taken a little bit of uh, demystifying to talk about mission and vision and an infrastructure. 
We become an innovator in this space. I believe in creativity, and you have to be able to implement your dreams and your business plan. But nothing works unless you have engagement and collab collaboration and strategic partners. And how great is this for me in Los Angeles not to have to board an airplane to make a speech but get in my car. But what I'm saying is Bob Cameron asks me every year to come and speak. He could be worried I'd be trying to pull money out of someone's pockets or take some claim or fame. But we work together as strategic par partners because we know we're bigger and better as two than as single voices. This problem is going on. We know that we have, and for Congress I break it down so they can understand that we cannot identify the risk and manage it, that we have consumer environmental and occupational exposure today in our country. And how is that in the, in the, in the land that we live in and we're such a prosperous country that we know these things and we've done nothing to mitigate this disaster? So it didn't take long for me to figure out that when Alan got diagnosed in 2003, there wasn't a smart anything. Phones were just phones. The next year, it was just amazing. Google this, smartphones, Facebook. It was through my daughter at the time that she says, Mommy, I think I need a Facebook page. And at the time, I'm thinking, it's so much with Alan. He died three years after his surgery. I was being a single mother, wondering, what on earth is my 14-year-old daughter telling me I need Facebook for? She needed a community service project. I listened, and I encourage all of you today to listen. Go outside your comfort box as you work to research and treat patients. Think how you can also communicate the work that you do. I chose social network, social media advocacy, to allow us to expand our message, to reach our lawmakers and influencers, to help make our message go further. We want to engage, educate, collaborate, and advocate. If we don't, we're not clicking on all cylinders. So what makes ADO different than some of the other nonprofits? I believe humbly from my heart, it's through our authenticity, transparency, and trust that we've developed these core values. People know what they're going to get when they come to our website. We sell nothing, we ask for nothing, and they know that we don't have a stake in litigation. They want to help with education. They want to help with advocacy and have their stories told in Congress. But they also might want community support when they're undergoing chemotherapy. We heard a lot today about clinical trials. We know that some of the life expectancies have been increased by some of the different treatments by a single agent or a second line trial. But we don't talk about is the quality of life that these patients go through undergoing treatment in hopes that they'll be the one in a million. We, ADIO, try to balance treatment, quality of life, the truth that's out there. So we take pride in the mentoring and the partnerships that we've developed. Just briefly, don't get scared by this slide. It really is to just um, give you an idea of the different eight steps of collaboration. You can collaborate with just one of these steps, but really to be effective and efficient, I think it takes all of these steps. I mean, starting with awareness, going all the way through to motivation, self-synchronization. I mean, I'm not going to read these off, and unfortunately, it's not in your syllabus. I'll make it available online, Claire, so you can share. But I think that it takes all of these different eight steps to truly be a collaborator, an innovator, and a change maker. I'm 58. I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. I want this misery to end for the Jarvis family, for the Reinstein family, for everyone else. So what, would, what do we try to do? I'm a digital storyteller. And with the help of Dr. Lemon and others, we're able to tell our story. It might be scientific. It might be personal. It might be congressional testimony for Congress. But we want these seven facts to go through the veins of others that hear us. We want to be seen, heard, felt. We want our stories shared, understood, discussed, and remembered. So what's exciting to me as a kind of a geek and a nerd, and obviously a passionate woman and a public health advocate, is that technology is working. We don't have those simple phones that Alan and I had in 2003. We have smartphones. I can conduct business in India from, it's not this phone, from, from my iPhone. I can send documents all over the world. I can have an interview via Skype. I can help someone, and so can our network. I think the last bullet point there is in 2012, 61% of American adults looked online for health information. And guess what? That's just doubled in 10 years. Where are we going to be 10 years from now? 
So let's take a look at storytelling, at our social advocacy. The three components I think that make us strongest and help us to stay energized is the fact that everybody has a piece of this job that we're doing and hopefully feel the success and share our momentum. We do a lot of storytelling, as I mentioned, but we also do blogs and infographics and we do research. So which, which storytelling element would you prefer? Do you want to look at the visual description of a triangle, or shall I read to you that a, pl at a plain figure with three straight sides and three angles? We have a millisecond to grab your attention. And if we don't catch Robert's attention, his phone is beeped, he's on another phone call. I mean, that's what we're doing with our lawmakers. So we have to be so succinct, so concise, and compelling in what we say. If the human brain processes visuals 60,000 times faster than text, I'm there. So what we do, and Dr. Lemon worked closely, it took us six months, not on this infographic, but we have one, and I'll make sure that Claire and, and Bob do have that, is that we are trying to tell the stories of asbestos and mesothelioma through pictures and facts and stats. This is just a simple F infographic that my intern and I put together. And it's so simple. The, there are two ways to end mesothelioma, prevention and a cure. Promising research continues but for now, it's prevention. And I'm hoping by the time I finish this quick talk, you'll be on board for helping us with education. 30 Americans die every day, 30. 300 people die every day around the world. So we've, I've had to be creative and implement different storytelling campaigns to fix, to really fit different issues. And we might do like a single six word quote, and I know Claire has even participated. It might be a quick, graphic or a slide or a quote from a patient, or it may be a longer share your story, which we're working on right now with, with, with you folks, so that we can take stories to Congress. We want every lawmaker, and Chuck, I hope you'll share your story so we can take it to Congress. We want them to understand the scope of this disease. What's the latency period like? What are the high risk occupations? How does this affect not only the patient, but the entire family? We've been able to do research, which is exciting through social media. Because we have built a very broad, expansive, diverse community, we can ping the scientific community, the patient community, workers. So w these are just a, a, an example of two recent surveys that we actually did. We wanted to find out what supportive resources, resources patients were given upon diagnosis, what did they want, what was effective, and we found some great and interesting things. Then we asked them about clinical trials and another one. How many had they had? How was it explained from their medical provider? So we could actually calibrate and report back to the scientific community how our mesothelioma patients and their families are feeling. And I, I want to tell you, we are way beyond the conversation here. When NCI t starts talking about clinical trials on Twitter, I know that we have arrived at the state of technology. I mean, this is exciting when the government is tweeting about clinical trials. I mean, 10 years ago, you know, people would think you're nuts if you're saying, yeah, hey, I was just tweeting about a clinical trial. I mean, this is really a conversation on language that is socially accepted and lawmakers use. So what, what I like to think is that we bring things together where knowledge and action unite. We know it takes these three components to, to make this come together. We need education, we need research, and we need legislation. All three things support the, the circle that will help us end this man-made disaster. We face many legislative challenges, and like Claire asked you to sign their petition for the VA Center, I urge you to stay connected to us. When we finish, if you please find me or Dr. Lemon, or even Claire at the end, is we want to keep you engaged in what's happening in Washington. You're doing fabulous work within, with your patients or with research, but we need you to help us in Washington. You're a very, very powerful voice. When the, when the private community comes together as professionals and we bring you out of your lab with your white coat on, Congress listens. We're gonna be doing our sixth congressional staff briefing in July. We have member meetings, we meet with the EPA. This is not meant to be boastful. This just means that when we partner together, we can connect and share at an exponential level. And we want to seat at that stakeholder meeting when they're writing legislation. And Dick and I have had the opportunity and honor to testify at Senate and House hearings before. We want that to continue. We want to bring your voice with us as well. Just this last April, I had goosebumps, but I really was just gobsmacked, as they say in England. The Surgeon General 
the Sur U.S. Surgeon General, acting Surgeon General, but I actually don't like to use that word, came and gave our keynote speech. For 45 minutes, he validated and expressed his commitment to raising awareness as America's doctor trying to prevent asbestos diseases. We have the ear of our lawmakers and our government. We want your commitment to help us take education, advocacy, and community a little further. And I think closing on this quote, it's, it's just one of my favorites, is never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has, said Margaret Mead. So please find us afterwards. Let's stay friends. And thank you so much for this amazing conference. Um, a job well done to all of you. I know there are three patients that are fighting for their life. They're waiting for me to report, is there anything new?